Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18. James 3, 13 through 18. But before we begin, uh, let's have a, a word of prayer. And if you have any prayer requests, we want to encourage you to, uh, to share those prayer requests with us at this time. Uh, gentlemen, do you have any prayer requests for this evening? Uh, for our country. You know, Pray for our country. Yeah, uh, for the church. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, for my family. Uh, the Lord knows our needs, but you know. Judy, uh, Judy seems to be doing better, so. That's very good. And she was recently in the hospital, so right. she's back home and doing well. Yep. That's great to hear. Um, Eric, do you have any prayer requests? As you probably know, my mother-in-law, Catherine, has had trouble with her, her knees, bad trouble with her knees lately. And uh, so we're hoping that, prayerful that that will get better before she has to go back to the doctor about it. And as well for uh, my wife, Lexanne, who is, uh, is uh, trying to trying to help out her you know, kids at home and, mm -hmm. and navigate through uh, being a PTA treasurer now and uh, still HOA president and a mom wow. and a lot, of, a lot of things going on. With a lot that. of hats to wear. A lot of hats yeah. to wear. Yeah, a lot of our parents right now are wearing multiple hats. Right. A lot of our kids are doing virtual learning. I know that uh, in my household, that's what we're doing. We're doing the virtual learning thing. Um, at least for a while, um, today Cobb County came out and said that they're going to start back, I heard, start phasing back yeah. in kids in the classroom, uh, which, you know, is is a welcomed announcement in uh, in my household. <laughs> uh, not because we haven't enjoyed the time with the kids. We just, you know, we uh, both Christian and I, we, you know, we went to school. She was homeschooled early on, but uh, we both went to public school later on, and it's just a, it's something that we think our kids would uh, appreciate in life so we're, we're looking forward to uh, getting them back in in school but, but isn't that been a great thing that, yeah. that parents have been able to sit down oh have I mean breakfast, it's been lunch, a blessing. And dinner with their children it really has get to know one another it's been a blessing it has been it has been yeah the Bible talks about how we ought to be uh, redeeming the time absolutely or making the most of the time that we have and mm -hmm. certainly we don't need to uh, to waste any any opportunity that God gives us to uh, no. to connect with people and uh, and love Him and love others, and um, you know how much how excited should we be when we have the opportunity to have more time with our kids and our grandkids? I mean that's just a blessing. It is, and uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity where we can ha begin to have more time one with another. Um, as as people are aware, um, we are in this mode where we're, we're, we've scaled back some of our assemblies because of uh, the coronavirus situation. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for the opportunity where we can come together more often. I think it might be uh, with the schools, if schools start back, that'll be uh, almost a marker that may initiate. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. In people's mind that, it, sure. you know, that we're more open and it, we uh, hopefully will back together soon to worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly our elders have uh, uh, some great decisions that they have to make, and so we need to be praying yeah. for, for them and for their wisdom Absolutely. as they lead us here at Macklin Road. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a prayer, and uh, for those of you who have joined us so far, Mark and Sarah and Linda, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, at this time, we will go ahead and pray to our Father in Heaven, and uh, then we will enter into our Bible study. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to you this evening and uh, we want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to study your word. Uh, Father, uh, tonight we have a few individuals on our mind who are in need of our prayer. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, Rick's wife, Judy. We pray that you continue to strengthen her. We have uh, uh, others on our prayer request list uh, tonight, Father. Eric asked us to pray for his mother-in-law, Catherine, uh, who's beloved here at Macklin Road, and uh, we want to pray uh, for her and for her sake, Father. 
We also want to pray for Lexan and all of our Christian women that we have here at Macklin Road who are doing so much, who always do so much, Father. We pray that you would bless them. Uh, Father, we also want to pray for those who are on our prayer request list at this time, uh, for uh, Sarah Cowan, uh, for Sister Cruz, uh, for uh, Evelyn Jackson, uh, for Martha Maxwell, Dot Evans, Blanche Edwards, Eloise Hunter, uh, Bess Saeed, Doug Hamilton, Charles Little, Larry Grimes, and uh, Kat Grayson, among, among many others, Father, we, we ask that you would consider them in uh, their state of need and that you would be a blessing uh, to them. And we know that you are a good God, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And uh, Father, we, we want to rejoice in that this evening. Uh, Father, we want to pray that this Bible study will be a blessing uh, not only to the lives of, of the men here gathered around this table, but we play, pray also it would be a blessing uh, to those who are viewing this study online. We want to pray for uh, those who are searching for truth and searching to uh, come to know you. We pray that you would reveal yourself unto them. Uh, Father, thank you for the gift that is Jesus. Uh, thank you for the hope and the life that we have in him. And Father, we pray that we are looking unto him always. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get into our study for this evening. All right, for uh, the study, we are going to be looking at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Uh, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Rick, uh, what version of the scriptures are you looking at tonight? New King James. New King, and what about you, Eric? ESV as well. ESV as well, okay. And uh, from whatever translation you might be uh, looking at, um, personally, we, we just ask that you, you follow along with us. Uh, this is one of those passages uh, that is uh, heavy on the, uh, it's heavy on the theological terms. There, there's a lot of, you know, terms, words, uh, that, that we're just going to have to define as we go through it. Uh, this is a very deep, rich portion of Scripture. Would you agree with that? Yes, very it is. Much, very much. Um, having said that, it's, it's all very relevant. It's all very contemporary to the things that we're seeing in the world today. Uh, some of the problems that we find in the world today exist because of some of the things that James writes about here in James chapter 3 verses 13 through 18. However, the solution is also there. The solution's there. Uh, before we read the scripture um, together, do either one of you want to say any opening remarks, maybe about, well, just about anything before we get into it? Ready okay. to jump into it. Ready to jump into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Eric, do you want to read the uh, scripture for us? We're in James 3, beginning at verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. <clears throat> but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay, there's a lot here. Uh, Rick, do you have any initial thoughts after we've just read this uh, scripture together? Uh, turn on your TV. Turn on your TV. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You look at uh, some of the things that Eric just read. Mm -hmm. uh, the confusion, uh, the uh, conduct, the, the bitter envy, the strife. It's dog-eat-dog -dog world. You look at our politics. You look at... Uh, um, it's a selfish world. It's, it's all about the individual. There's no compassion, it seems. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is nothing new. I mean, this is, it's happened before. Right. But how do we, I think us three know the solution to it. I mean, it can be found right here, but you know, how do we get this across to those who are listening, who are confused, scared? You, you speak about the, uh, 
the disorder, the, the chaos, the confusion that exists in the world today. And that, that's something specifically that, uh, that James mentions in verse 16. He says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder. Mm -hmm. There will be disorder in every vile practice. And certainly I would agree with you. Turn on your TV and you will see disorder. Turn on your TV and you will see every vile practice. Um, I, I believe that the scripture that we're studying tonight is in some ways a, an ancient commentary on a modern problem that we have. Uh, and, and as we look to the news or, you know, whatever form of, you know, whatever, whatever way you get your news, whether it be the TV, the, the Internet or the newspaper, as we hear the news that comes across our feeds every single day, certainly we see that disorder. And I know I don't like it. Yeah. I, I think every sane person would have some sort of displeasure from, from hearing about these things. Having said that, I think some relish in it. They love it. That's, that's the reason the TVs are, are wide open. People, people yeah. love this strife. They feed off of it. That's, that's, yeah. that's what they live for. And, and what's really scary about this is our children are the ones who are getting greatly impacted by this. And how are they, their minds are developing when they see all that you two are describing right now. I'm, I'm reminded of back in Judges, I think around chapter 17, it says everyone did what is right in their own eyes. In their own eyes. Right. Yeah. So, and that's, to me, that summarizes how people are acting right now. They're but, acting in well, the, what they think is right. But with this, uh, this pandemic that's going on, maybe with the children being home, maybe in God's infinite wisdom, this is a way that we could kind of sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and explain to them and, and show them and protect them in, in a way so that when they are back out in, in a public setting like school, uh, they won't be so, uh, so scared. Maybe they'll have a, some understanding of it. Yeah. They might see the, the stark difference if, when, when kids are returning back to school and amongst other kids. Okay, I just came from home when I'm around my parents and you know, our, our, our friends here versus immediately when they come to this, come back to school and see the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. See that difference. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so are you, are you disheartened by the chaos, the confusion, the warmongering that you see in the world? I know that I am. Well, so what's the solution to these things? I, I believe the solution is in these verses. I, I believe it's there. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's begin to, to dive right into it. Right. Um, I, I will say that I don't believe that James is necessarily addressing the conflict that is going on in the world. I, I think he's more concerned inwardly. I, I think that his, his concern here is primarily about conflict within the church. Um, and, and sometimes that happens. I mean, it shouldn't be this way. Uh, this uh, if you think about all that Christ has done for our sake to reconcile us to God, to bring peace to our lives, um, we, we have peace with God because of what he's done for us. We don't always have peace one with another in the church, and that's a problem, and we're going to talk about it. And James, I think, he wants to talk about it. Uh, that's why this portion of Scripture is here. Uh, well, but where a lot of that conflict comes in to view is because we just have, we have different opinions about things. Um, and, and sometimes those opinions will, you know, bump into one another and there's, there's friction there and there's conflict. Uh, we should understand that that in some respects is inevitable, but we really need to be considering how we respond to conflict, how we respond whenever someone disagrees However, how we, how we respond whenever things don't go our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had something well, you wanted yeah, to say. Yeah, I, I believe that, that James, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he, he's addressing this probably to teachers. Uh, I believe you're right. And, and, but right. also, you know, to, to leaders or those who may have some kind of um, uh, control or oversight of people. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's where I was. Well, why do you say that? He gives, he gives so many references. If you, if you, if you 
can take this and kind of dissect it. I've got some notes right here that I had written, and uh, he talks about wisdom. He talks about uh, the tongue. He says a lot about the tongue. Yeah, a lot. he does. That's really what the first 12 verses of chapter 3 are yep. all about. Yep. And if you missed that lesson last week, you can go back and, and watch it <clears throat> online. I think Josh and Raphael and, and Caleb all participated in that discussion. But the reason why I ask you that question, Rick, is because in the very first verse of the chapter, he gives this warning. And the warning is, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I think about um, the, the ancient world in particular, the Jewish culture, which the church was primarily Jewish. This is, I believe, the first book of the New Testament written. So you have an, uh, the church in, in its state of infancy, really, and the church is comprised of Jews. Uh, the Jewish people, they held uh, to a great level of honor those who taught the Word of God. Uh, it was... Um, it was a compliment for someone to come to Jesus and call him rabbi because everybody in that world, they knew what a rabbi was. It, mean, it meant that you are a teacher come from God. You are someone important. Uh, you, we should listen to you. You have something of value to give to us. Well, here's what happens. In, in the early church, apparently, there were some who wanted to be seen in that light. They, they wanted to be seen as someone who had special knowledge. They wanted to be seen as wise. They wanted, they wanted to be seen as someone who had understanding. And I think that's the reason why James gives that warning because if you place yourself in that position, if you assume too much responsibility, if you say, well, I have all this wisdom, I have all this understanding, I have all this knowledge, do you understand that you're gonna be held to a greater level of judgment? Do you understand that the tongue is a very dangerous thing, which is what he's you know, concerned with at the beginning of the chapter. It's, it's, it, it's this little member, but it's so hard to control, mm -hmm. right? You can get into a lot of trouble mm -hmm. by the things that you say, and you can lead others astray by the things that you say. So are you sure that you want to sign up to uh, be seen uh, in the eyes of others as someone who is wise and someone who has knowledge and understanding? I believe that the, the text that we're considering tonight is, is all related to that concept, right? Because we live in a world where everybody thinks that they're wise. Everybody thinks that they have understanding. Again, that's why we have all this conflict. People have strong opinions and they hold on to their opinions and they're very, uh, very, you know, rooted into their opinion. And they almost think that if you don't have that opinion, uh, you must be stupid or, or you must be foolish. And when that occurs, oftentimes we wind up abusing others, mistreating others. We, we wind up going to war with others. And really, that's, to me, what this passage is concerned with. Yeah. Conflict. It's in the world. Sometimes it's in the church. And, and I think verse 13, uh, Rick, do you want to read verse 13 for us? Sure. <clears throat> Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. What, what do you think this question that he asked here is all about, Eric? Who is wise and understanding among you? Why do you think he asked that question? Well, he is, I think he's, he's asking amongst uh, people who are perhaps in a position of teaching and, and making that question of, of actually who, who is, uh, wise and well wise and understanding how how do we define that and are people defining that amongst them, their own selves uh, amongst all the ones who who claim to be uh, teachers I see it as a an invitation uh, it's a, it's an invitation to see whether or not you really are wise you really have understanding because there are some people in the world today who think that they're wise they think that they're wise but they're not um, I think about uh, the people that Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 1 um, those who do not know God he's he said there that claiming to be wise they became fools claiming to be wise so there, there's such a thing that exists as someone a human being claiming to have wisdom but being very far from the, from the picture of wisdom 
itself. And so I think that he's proposing this question really to all of us. Uh, do you consider yourself to have any sort of wisdom? Do you consider yourself to have any sort of understanding? Um, if you do, let's put that to the test. And I think that's what verse 13 is all about. Um, and, and what is the test? It almost seems, has a tone of almost sarcasm in a way. I think so, yeah. I think you're right about that. Well, he cut to the chase, James did, which is really out of his character, I think. I think he was kind of a mild to me. Uh, but I, I think he, he did. He kind of tested us, you know, just mm -hmm. let's see. Yeah. Um, in, in verse 13, the, the test, uh, the measure of whether or not someone has wisdom and understanding um, can be seen by looking at his or her works. Um, good conduct. Good conduct is the evidence of wisdom. Good conduct is the evidence of understanding. Uh, and that good, good conduct is expressing itself in a certain way. There has to be a certain virtue in place before good conduct can, can happen. And, and that conduct is meekness meekness. Um, is that what your translation says on verse 13? Does it use that term meekness? Let him it show does. his works it in does. the meekness of yes. wisdom. Yes. So uh, Eric, what does it mean to be meek? We're well, doing it, meekness can mean several things, but to me it means uh, doing things with gentleness. And gentleness, empathy, which is empathy for others and yeah. considering the other persons first and trying to be nice or uh, trying to, I, I think gentle is the best. Yeah, it doesn't best mean that uh, um, you're weak or, or right. you know, you can be, uh, we see, you know, brethren all around who are very strong, robust men, but they're right. very meek and gentle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get confused, I believe, with that. They think somebody's being meek, you know, I think somebody that's, maybe withdrawn a little bit and uh, uh, standoffish maybe. I, I love how, um, how one resource, um, um, a Greek di dictionary I use often, how this defines the word, the Greek word that's used here. Um, meekness or gentleness is the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. There are some people today who are overly impressed by their own sense of self-importance. Mm -hmm. And if, if that is characteristic of, of your life, if you think that you're important, well, you're not going to live out a meek kind of life because, well, you, you're doing the opposite, right? And, and if you think you're important, you are going to go to war with everyone and anyone who gets in your way, uh, in the way of what? In the way of your own selfish ambition, in the way of your own jealousy, which is what he's concerned with here in James chapter three. In fact, he contrasts uh, true wisdom and true understanding with another form of wisdom, earthly kind of wisdom, uh, later in the text. Uh, in verse 14, he says, but if you have bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Uh, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. Are these godly attributes, Rick? No, not at all. Why is that? What is it about bitter jealousy and selfish ambition that is very far removed from the heart of God? A Christian his ambition is to please God to do those things which he, he would have us to do. Um, uh, Self-seeking, um, that's something else that, that should not enter our thoughts or minds. We should uh, uh, live peaceably. We should, we should uh, my mind just went blank. Uh, well, help him out there. How do we yeah. define yeah. selfish ambition? Or you know, boasting, uh, being gentle and meek, you, 
you don't you can say more by being gentle and meek and uh, uh, never say a word I, I remember uh, when we were at uh, Mary's house the other day when and I remember brother Harold and I remember I just remember watching him and the things that he didn't say and what I learned from that yeah he had a spirit of meekness yeah about him. absolutely absolutely yeah well selfish ambition it does imply pride but all it implies of implies pride and and ambition is not always trying to get something from somebody else but perhaps trying to enforce yep. your own personality and your own uh, your, thoughts your, about how good you <laughs> maybe about your maybe about your bible knowledge or just pick anything uh that or about may, things you want to have done or things you want to accomplish you want to have done or yep. things that uh and, and I think of bitter jealousy. That those are two really nasty words to be together. Yeah. You're bitter towards somebody. Um, that is that that is a that is a, an action that is not forgotten by the other person. That is comes with a, a lot of. It could be anger. It could be standoffish. It could be resentment that comes through to the other person because uh, bitter jealousy. Um, you, if you're jealous of something, then if maybe you're jealous not of that person's position in their life or that person's uh, any number of things. So you're going to act negatively, act negatively toward that person uh, in whatever actions and conversation you have with them, and that's going to impact and greatly impact. It's all about the other person and how our, how we can affect them. Yeah. Well, well, think about how this, you know, relates in the political climate that we're presently living in. There's a lot of people politically who are selfishly ambitious. They, they have an agenda. They have an opinion that they want their opinion to be realized. They want their agenda to be accomplished. And they're very, you know, very zealous, which zeal and jealousy are related terms. They're very zealous in their efforts. And, and if the efforts of someone else or some other party are being accomplished, you know, we're just going to throw a, a temper tantrum until mm -hmm. we get our way. And I think that's true for both sides. Um, and then in the church, I think about the, the, uh, the admonition to, you know, give some caution to those who would become teachers. Think about how this can, uh, how, can how it can rear its head in the church. Uh, if I have been a Christian and someone else is given an opportunity that I think that I deserve, mm -hmm. Um, and, I, and I'm, I'm jealous about that. I'm envious of their opportunity, their position. Um, and, and I begin to act out of selfish ambition. I can begin to uh, try to remove that person from that position to say, well, that, that's where I should be. And, and James is going to tell us here in this uh, chapter that if that's the way we operate, then what's going to follow is disorder or chaos. You're going to bring chaos wherever you go if you if you act out of that mindset. And then you're going to bring every vile practice. And so really, uh, selfish ambition and jealousy are kind of the, the roots to the fruits that are being produced uh, in James chapter 3. So, and where are those things found? They're found in your heart, verse 14. Right. So oftentimes it is the case that whenever something bad happens in the world or something bad happens in the context of a local congregation, we, we can trace that back to the heart really every time. And, and what's there? It's bitter jealousy sometimes, selfish ambition most every time. So we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard because uh, the devastation that these two things cause, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, uh, it, it is tragic, not only in our world, but sometimes even in the church. What do you think, Rick? I agree. I agree. We've seen it. I've, uh, you know, you, you Christians in particular, uh, they're so excited. They, they're, they're on fire. They're, they want to do all they can, and you want to, you want to encourage them. You want to, to build them up and, and ask them to do something that that maybe somebody else has been doing 
but you're wanting to encourage these folks. You want them to help grow and, and have seen people, like you said, just get so excited because well, that was my deal, that was my job. And to cause friction between a, a new Christian. And that's, um, uh, I've, I've seen that happen, unfortunately. It happens, and, and we have to find a healthy balance there. We have to give opportunities uh, to, to people who, who are you know, well-suited for them. And, mm -hmm. and let's just face it, we're not all going to be teachers. Um, not everybody gets to stand up and preach on Sunday morning. Not everybody mm -hmm. gets to, to lead an adult Bible class. Not everyone gets to you know, sit, de sit with the, uh, the kids in the, uh, in the two- and the, the three-year-old class. Not everybody's suited for that. We, mm -hmm. we all have our own unique role within the body of Christ. God is the one who places us within um, the, the area of service that, that he deems fit. So we just need to have caution to assume too much responsibility, I think what I'm trying to say. Uh, and, and we also need to rejoice, and here this is so important, we need to rejoice when others are serving in an area that is well suited for them. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we need to rejoice when good things happen in their lives and not covet those opportunities. You know, there, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a position in the Lord's church for, for anybody that wants to work. Yep. You know, it may not be public, but it can be something that, that can be fulfilling to you. Uh, you know, it's going to bring glory to, to the Lord. But there's, if you want to work, there's, there's a spot here. And there's nothing like being happy and, and doing something for the Lord. Amen. Eric, do you have anything you want to add on uh, verses 13 and 14 before we move on down the text? No, but I, I think this is a call to us all. Uh, I know it's framed within, and it certainly is framed within the idea of teachers um, <clears throat> in that official capacity, but we can all take this, oh, what, take, have a takeaway here. No oh, yeah, you are, absolutely. Uh, even a teenager can have a takeaway from this. Yep. Um, I, I don't. I don't want. I wouldn't want someone to be dissuaded uh, from this. From teaching. From this statement, it says not let many of you be teachers. I wouldn't want somebody to. I think it would be. You no. Know, it is a word of warning framed amongst all of these uh, uh, scripture that we have here. Uh, but I think that. Um, the desire to become a teacher is is a good thing. It's desire it is. to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is exactly the reason why we're reading this, so that we can be wise in our pursuit of becoming good teachers. That desire to be a teacher is a good thing because we must be teaching people about Jesus. But the way that we have that desire, in my opinion, it matters. Mm -hmm. Again, um, we must do that with, with meekness. Uh, and again, that idea conveys the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. We shouldn't want to be teachers because we think that, you know, we're, we're going to be the greatest teacher um, that walked the face of the earth since Jesus and that, you know, no one can do it as good as, as we can. That, that's, not the, that's not the mindset we should have. We should want to teach. We should want to lead. We should want to serve because that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And we want to be like him. And, and maybe, just maybe, by the grace of God, God can do something with that. Not because of us, but in spite of us. Well, one text I was reading said, if the teacher claims to be possessed by a superior knowledge by which he, by which he believes himself to be capable of instructing others, let him prove it with godly life uh, filled with good works. And that's the key. That, that's really what we're being charged to do here. We are being charged to show good conduct through the, the meekness mm -hmm. or by the meekness of wisdom. And that's we, impossible to do if we're selfishly ambitious or if we're jealous and of others. One was one's wisdom is evidenced not by argument or assertion, but by a godly life uh, covered with good deeds. Amen. That's a great statement. All right, um, before we move to verse 15, we didn't really talk about that last phrase of verse 14. Uh, he says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, 
do not boast and be false to the truth. I think what he means by this, and see if you guys won't agree, um, I think what he means by this is if you fancy yourself to be wise and understanding, but at the same time, you are selfishly ambitious, and at the same time, you are jealous of others, then, then you're lying, right? You're, 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 bo you're boasting about, yeah, you're lying mm -hmm. to yourself, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Because, because the, the scripture should be a mirror of our, of our soul. Yep. And if uh, we are, if we are pursuing selfish ambition and, and, and jealousy and, and things as such, then right, we are, we are lying not only to ourselves, but we're lying to God and we're lying to our own uh, we're, faith to the gospel itself. Yeah. We're boasting right. because we're, we're painting ourselves in a certain light. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wise. I, I have understanding. That's, that's boasting. But then we're also lying because the things that we're saying about ourselves, about ourselves, is not true. We well, you know we can fool, we can fool others, but we can't. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I think that behaving this way is is quite obvious to the audience. If, if, if someone who is acting as a, as a, te trying to teach in this manner and these, these elements are coming through, then yeah. it's no secret. It's no secret, and right, it causes disorder in the church. It causes well, wasn't, so many problems. Uh, was it the Pharisees, I believe, that, that wore these uh, yeah. phylact phylacteries, that what yeah. it was, and uh, stand on the corners, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, some, people, prayers, some people some people adored them, and some people said, you know, yeah. you're just, uh, you're hollow. Yeah, I, I would agree with what you just said, Eric. Um, the kind of wisdom that we need in our life is not the wisdom that looks like the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. That was the earthly kind of wisdom. We need the wisdom that looks like Jesus. And when we have that kind of wisdom, it's going to be evident, right? It, yes. It's going to be evident. People are going to see it, and they're also going to see that kind of wisdom that the Pharisees had. Mm -hmm. It's just nothing but a show. Um, it, it's an effort to grab power, to grab influence, and to be seen as important uh, out of a, a, an inflated sense of self-importance. Okay, so verse 15. Uh, again, talking about that, that wisdom that is jealous and selfishly ambitious. He says, this is not, verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual. And then that last word, demonic. Demonic, yeah. Demonic. That's kind of like a, a triad of, of just ugliness there. Who's who of ugliness, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Earthly wisdom, unspiritual wisdom, demonic wisdom, these things, they, they exist. They exist, and if we're not careful, we can be guilty of practicing this form of wisdom. But there's a better kind of wisdom, right? Sure is. Okay. And that's something that we should point out here in this text. There is a wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic and then there's another kind of wisdom altogether. It's not earthly wisdom. It comes down from above. Heavenly wisdom. Yeah, heavenly wisdom. Right, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that wisdom here in just a minute. Um, but is, is there anything you gentlemen want to add on uh, verse 15? Well, it, it comes to my mind is the importance of an example, the importance of behavior amongst people in the church that can be obvious to, to so that others can absorb it. Maybe someone doesn't read a lot in the Bible, but what they do see in, in here is these things, uh, wisdom demonstrated by others. So we have to be purposeful in exhibiting these things because we are, we are training others, we are these, these actions are being absorbed by others so that they too can be uh, exhibiting uh, wisdom mm -hmm. and, yeah. how they, and how they think and how they act. Otherwise, the opposite of that is how are they going to be influenced by others? They're, the influence by others in the world, 
people repeat. Yep. People will repeat what they see. And so it's important that we're repeating the good things, right? Yes, it's extremely important. Uh, verse, uh, in, in verse 15, he talks about the wisdom that comes down from above. Uh, he doesn't yet define what that is, but it's obviously not earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Uh, I found it interesting that um, the word that he uses here um, that is translated as coming down from above, the from above is, is what I have in mind here. Um, it, it's the same word that Jesus used in his conversation with Nicodemus. And, and the reason why, you know, I noted that was because I just preached on that text in John 3 just a few weeks ago. Jesus told Nicodemus that unless you're born again, and, and it's that word anathen, it has the idea of being born from above. Unless you're born above, born from above, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that which comes from above is from the realm of God, right? We have to experience the new birth. We have to be born from above. And then after we experience the new birth, we have to put on the, the things of the new self. We have to put on the things of the, the new man. Uh, things like lying used to be characteristic of who we were, but in Christ, it's not who we are. It's not what we do. We used to be a people who were um, bitterly jealous of others, but in Christ, we can't be that way anymore. Well, you know, that was, didn't mean to interrupt, but you know, look at, that first gospel sermon at Pentecost, you know, I mean, yeah. it was just, it was a who's who of, of things that people were doing wrong. And right. And that they had to learn a new way, absolutely. right? They had to yeah. learn God's way. Yep. Um, and so before they used to operate out of selfish ambition and we used to operate out of selfish ambition, but in Christ, you know, through the gospel, through the message of the gospel, now we're being taught to be like Jesus, to have the mind of Christ, to look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. So it, there, there's a change of life that should happen after we come to life in Christ. We are putting to death the old man and putting on the new self. And we do this by the power of God through the instruction of the scriptures uh, and, and by looking to the example of Jesus. Okay, uh, and then in verse 16, um, he, he makes the simple statement here, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. We've already talked about this scripture briefly. To me, this is the, the fruit of the rotten root. The rotten root of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Where those activities are going on, what is going to be produced are these two, two things. Disorder and every vile practice. All right? Now... Again, let's think about the world we're living in. There's a lot of, a lot of disorder. What's the cause? Selfishness. It's, Selfishness. It's all about them. It's whatever, you know, what can I get that I want, and it doesn't matter how I get it. And then I want what other people have. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how I get it. That, that's the key. It doesn't matter how I get it, no, but I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And I'm going to run all over people just to get it. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, they really don't mind uh, how they do it. Public, behind the scenes, it doesn't matter. It can happen in the church, too. Uh, when a Christian becomes jealous of another Christian, or when a Christian craves, covets, wants the opportunities that others have, in the church there can be disorder. And even in the church there can be every sort of vile practice. And that's just a general umbrella term right there. Um, what, what sort of vile practices uh, fit the bill there, Eric? What, what could he be talking about? I, I was, um, I'll just be honest with you. I was thinking, you know, you were talking about in the Lord's church. Yeah. I, I didn't even want to go there. I mean, just to think that, you know, the Lord's church could be practicing anything like that. Well, you could go back to the book of the Church of Corinth. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I was, I was kind of looking at it today, you know, but, oh, back, yeah, yeah. 
Well, yeah. it, 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 it makes it clear that we're not, um, this can happen. And yeah. file practices, we don't want to maybe think of specifics there, but they do happen in the, in the Lord's church. They do happen. Church is and, split because of the kind of things we're talking about. Right. Yes, witnessed, yeah. witnessed it. Brethren, stop talking to one another because of the kind of things we're talking about. I think vile is a strong word. Used it is a very strong, I mean, it's a vile thing, though. To, um, if we think about where this ends, division. God uh, hates, God I mean, hates that, that. There's nothing that is more vile than that. God. You're talking about splitting up the body of Christ? And he hates that. That's a, that's a great underline, the emphasis on that word and how strong... This, this, this is and what kind of impact it has on the, on the church and, uh, and families. Yeah, too. you know, who have grown up together who and then over for something. Um, and then it, it just becomes a, a, a waiting game to see who can wait out the other. And, you know, people's uh, lives are turned upside down. Like you said, uh, souls have been lost because of, of, of things like that. And it's, it's weighty on the elder's shoulders to be able to, to know and to know the congregation well enough to be able to, to, to know about these things. Right, you can't, you can't sweep it under the rug. You're no. going to have to address it. Right. You know? yeah. I, I just can't help but think about Jesus' prayer. Uh, in John chapter 17. I know I'm taking a detour here, but our conversation has reminded me of the importance for unity. Whenever Jesus was just hours away from the death that he died on the cross, he, he prayed to his Father, and uh, he prayed for himself, he prayed for his uh, apostles, and he prayed for us. I, I just want to pick up at verse 20 of John 17. Jesus is in the middle of praying. He says, I do not ask for these only, for the apostles only, what he means by that, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about me and you gentlemen mm -hmm. and everyone else who has come to faith through the preaching of the apostles mm -hmm. and other inspired individuals. And then in verse 21, what's his prayer? What is the prayer of Jesus that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe. And that's important. The reason why Jesus wants us to be one is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Think about that. It seems to be the case that if we were one, if we were truly united, how much more could we do in the world? How much more could God do in our lives if we were truly one? If we, if we stopped operating out of selfish ambition and jealousy, if we just said, hey, I rejoice when you rejoice, I weep when you weep. Now let's be in the business of sharing the name of Jesus with others. I mean, I just... That's our job, soul winning, isn't it? It is. Sometimes, however, these things that we're talking yeah, about, yeah. about tonight, they get in the way. They, they distract us from what we should be doing. And that's, 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 from, that's from the devil. It is. That's where he... That's where he gets his joy. That's, you know, he knows our weaknesses or he knows when to yep. mm -hmm. throw the flag up for us to stumble or stop or say, hey, let me step back and look at this when we should just be. Yep. Uh, Sometimes we're confused because of the disorder. Uh, sometimes we're having to deal with vile practices and we're having to deal with sin and, and address it. Um, all these things exist because, according to James, because of jealousy and because of selfish ambition. Now, let's, in, in closing tonight, how are we doing on our time, by the way? In closing tonight... Nine minutes. We're good. Let's look at verses 17 and 18 and talk about the kind of wisdom that God wants us to have. And, of course, in James chapter 1, he's already told us to pray for wisdom, mm -hmm. right? If mm -hmm. any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So, tonight, let us be asking that God would give us his wisdom, the wisdom that comes down from above. Um, Rick, do you want to read verses 17 through sure. 18 for us, and then we'll begin to conclude. All right. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And I like that. I, I love it. Um, notice that um, there, there's a certain kind of fruit which God's wisdom produces. And what is that? Earthly and heavenly. Well, I, I'm thinking about oh. a good kind of fruit. A, a, um, a harvest of righteousness. And yes. that word harvest there is karpos. It's the same word as good fruits in verse 17. So God's wisdom produces a harvest or a fruit of righteousness. God, and what is that? He identifies that to be peace, to be uh, making peace. God's wisdom makes peace, right? Earthly wisdom makes conflict. God's wisdom makes peace. And Eric, would you kind of, would you be willing to run through that list of attributes concerning the wisdom from above in verse 17? The first one is pure. Pure is uh, untainted uh, by any other, by any other uh, type of uh, influence or any other besides what God has given us, mm -hmm. is, is strictly what God has given us, none other. It is pure, it is, it is uh, not, nothing evil about it. Yep. Nothing evil, nothing um, selfish, nothing that man, nothing fleshly about it uh, is, is pure and acceptable to God. And then after it's pure, it's peaceable. Peaceable. Right? Um, again, we're not... We're not looking for a fight here. We're not looking for conflict. We want peace. And to be peaceable is to seek peace wherever it's possible. You know, just a few Wednesday nights ago, uh, we had a lesson about peace. If it's possible uh, to, to have peace with someone, we should, we should seek it. Mm -hmm. it, should, it should be something that we're working to uh, achieve because Jesus said, blessed are the, the peacemakers. Mm -hmm they mm -hmm. shall inherit the earth. So it's peaceable. It's gentle, uh, which is, you know, similar to the idea of meekness. Mm -hmm. Impartial, okay. which is, you know, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, I'm just interested in the truth. Um, just no, no, partial, no partiality and then sincere. Everything that you do is, is out of love and, and concern one for another. And, and, and the, the difference is the fruit. The earthly wisdom produces a certain kind of fruit. Um, a, um, a, a certain kind of fruit which is producing disorder and producing every vile practice. But the wisdom that comes from above is the kind of fruit that produces peace. And, and what a difference uh, those, the, those two things make. I think... Uh what what a what a great list mm -hmm. and these these demonstrated make for somebody they think i like to be with that person i like to be around that person these are these are all attributes that we have to be purposeful about mm -hmm. these do not we have to put it we have to we have to be purposeful in pursuing these things we have to be purposeful in in pursuing the these these ideas and these uh, characteristics that are from from heaven, because we have we're we're sinful people, and we we fall to our own issues, mm -hmm. problems, mm -hmm. as we are purposeful and as we make effort to do these things. Mm -hmm. That's what is uh, acceptable, and that's and that's that's being faithful, and that's being that's being a servant of God. Is what you it know, is. if you strive for that, it's just going to fill your bucket up. It's also going to it's going to, fill to other people. Uh, that's what it's, yeah, it's going to it's going to affect other people as well. Right. Yeah, and they're going to say, "Well, what's I want? I want what he's got." You know, or I want to feel like he's feeling well. Sure. Yeah, and we're coming to a point where we need to conclude. But Eric, you said something that it really hit home with me. The wisdom that comes from above is beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, think about this. Uh, it's the kind of wisdom which is characterized by purity, by peaceability, by gentleness, 
by being open to reason, by, by being full of mercy, and, and the, the kind of wisdom that bears forth good fruits, an impartial kind of behavior, a sincere kind of behavior, you know, that is something which is beautiful to see, and, and it's enticing. And that's the way that we should be as Christians. We should not be a people who turn other people away by our behavior. Right. Um, as, you know, in person, on social media, what have you, we should not be that kind of people where people just say, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with him because conflict and, and drama follows mm -hmm. him or her wherever he or she goes. There should be something beautiful about us to the point that others say, oh, what's that all about? Well, oh, I know that he's a Christian. I know she's a Christian. Maybe I should ask him you are, about Christ. You know, something else in verse 17 that I even even as a, a young teenager, I remember reading this several times over and over, willing to yield. And that just does yes. not, that doesn't fit in our, no, you know, no, not at all. no, <laughs> willing to yield. No, no, yeah. no, no, you know, and. Which is where meekness or humility there, or gentleness there, comes there, in. You, that's it. Um, that's it. We cannot think that, you know, we're, we're so important and, you know, it has to be our way. And well. Uh, if you are not a meek person, if you are not a humble person, you're never going to yield to God. You're never going to submit to Him, and you're especially not going to submit to one another in the church because, mm -hmm. you know, why should I do that? Well, it's a biblical command, submit to one another yep. out of reverence for Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the main takeaway, at least for me, is we have to be meek. We have to be meek. If we hope to be this beautiful person that that James has written about here in James chapter 3 where we are characterized by the wisdom from above, then meekness has to first be there. If we find in our hearts selfish ambition or jealousy, we're, we're just not going to be this kind of person. Well, you know, the third beatitude over in Matthew 5, 5, you know, it's, it's very evident there. Yeah, blessed so. are the meek. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Sarah Long says, God in the flesh, having all wisdom and power, displayed meekness and humility. What could we possibly have worthy of pridefulness? Either Sarah or James, one of you two. Uh, thanks for that comment. That's yeah. a great way for us to conclude. Um, so, Eric, can I ask you to lead us in a word of prayer as we close tonight? And specifically, would you ask God that we would receive his wisdom, that we would be wise to the point where we where we have the peace or, or the wisdom that comes from above and, and do not operate by the wisdom that is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Father in heaven, we are concluding this night um, uplifted and with the, um, the charge to pursue uh, your wisdom, that was the wisdom that the world needs to see, the wisdom and the meekness that we should be carriers of every day so that the world can see something different. Let us be purposeful in our efforts, Father. Uh, let us turn away from, let us turn away from those uh, times in which we may fall into uh, maybe jealousy or, 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 or ambition, personal selfish ambition, things which are contrary to you. We have uh, read your word tonight. We have been, been warned. We've been uplifted. And uh, we have been reminded, exhorted to pursue, to pursue your wisdom, to pursue goodness, to pursue uh, being that person that is a representative of, of you and in amongst this evil world. Thankful for everybody that's been viewing tonight, uh, that you were with us tonight here uh, during this, 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 uh, this time, and thank you for the, the people who have given comments. Strengthen them, and we ask that you be with everybody at home. Uh, help us to be together again. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank y'all. I enjoyed that, fellas. It was wonderful. Thank you.
appreciate you asking.